Okay, so day seven, we're one week in to our lockdown and we've done pretty well. And I think uh, yesterday was a bit trying. I was a bit exhausted. Today I was a bit exhausted, but um, but feel a bit more refreshed now. So uh, I've got a bit, I've got a day behind in my um, in my um, incredible page that's supposed to be going online today. So it'll go online tomorrow if you're following that. If you're reading that, thank you for uh, following and reading it. And I really appreciate you guys checking out risingsuncomics.com to check out the work I'm doing and all the other guys all around the world are doing. But thank you especially for supporting my work and our team's work. Um, all right, so I've got a whole bunch of things I want to I wanna start with. Let's start with something um, like Battlestar Galacta, Galactica. One of the original movies, one of the really long form um, sci-fi films that uh, you know, out of late seventies it came out in, and they were, um, and it just took off. And you know, the Cylons, uh, Buck, um, sorry, at the same time Buck Rogers was there, uh, Starbuck, as you know, and it was so good, you know, that um, they did a remake of it that was even really, really good, and it was no hold, no punches pulled. It was really, 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 really good, and I really appreciated it. And uh, and I and I binged watched that uh, Buck Rogers. I think uh, sorry, uh, better start. I keep thinking about Buck Rogers, but also if you if you if you know if you haven't seen Buck Rogers, check it out. It's just such fun, Twiggy and so on. And um, yeah, and uh, Farscape sort of like uh, while I'm on that uh, is a bit like Buck Rogers, where the guy gets lost in time and ends up in a future world or in an alien environment and uh, you know and has to bring bring his um his current day situation to a futuristic environment so firescape is a really good one to do right now if you think about what do i watch as a sci-fi fan or just as a good series to watch right now would buck rogers just for the nostalgia of it um uh, and firescape for modern day sort of thing they came out i think in about 2000s and i really enjoyed it it was um uh one of the um two of the people that were in it uh, i think it's uh claudia black and ben ben i can't remember ben's last name uh they'll come to me later he was in uh stargate um stargate series and it was really great to see them both of them being in there it was just i love them both they're just great actors and they're really really great personalities and uh I did did really enjoy um, Farscape because it was made in New, um, made in over in Australia, filmed over in Australia, and had a lot of Australian actors. So a couple of our own acted in them over there. Uh, by our own, I mean by New Zealand Kiwis. Okay, so Battlestar Galactica, right? So the Galactica, a futuristic aircraft carrier the size of a small city. So that's quite interesting. I remember um, I mentioned um, Babylon Five the other day, and um, the Galactica's bit like that and of course ds9 is a bit like that as well it's a, sh a whole entire city on a ship and uh whereas um this one moves right the galactica moves whereas um both the um, ds9 and also Babylon 5 they don't move they can be put um you know they can just move slightly but they can't fly off you know somewhere else because they're too big to do that and so it becomes a way station and um diplomatic um station uh so yeah so let's get to this the, the galactica a futuristic aircraft carrier the size of a small city careens through a distant star um, star field followed by a convoy of bizarre space vehicles all fleeing the destruction of the human race led by commander adama lawn green this is the original one um oh man i hate it when i can't remember names but you know who i'm talking about or the new uh, in the new series uh coming up adama these survivors have started started on a journey for to the to a 13 uh to a 13 sister colony in a distant galaxy star system a planet called earth uh battles of galactica follows these interstellar refugees and their battles battles with their enemy the dreaded lizard-like cylons so this is quite interesting like you know you got the robots um you know we're talking about Cylons, but you get the history of it in this one, which is really cool because this one's got special features. And I was really uh, excited to see this because it's got the real awesome painted um, uh, cover 
uh, you know, back in the day when you used to paint covers. Now it's just photographs of, um, as you can see some of the back there, of the actual images of the film or just uh, properly, you know, modeled scenes uh, and um, before a green screen or such. And so the extra, um, this is, uh, so it was like um, the guy who worked on the special effects are provided by uh, Jotun Dextra, Dextra, an Academy Award winner for his work on Star Wars. So, the, so you can see that the guy who did the special effects for this also worked on the original Star Wars. And I think if you, like I said, if you, um, it's a Glenn Larson production. So you, you guys who are in this, you know, who are, um, who are great fans of, um, of, um, of sci-fi already know who Glenn Larson is, so I don't have to go into that. But yeah, it's just a, just a really, really good, cool series to sit down and watch when you, when you're a bit upset at the current state of affairs in sci-fi right now with Star Trek and with Doctor Who. So going back to the old classics and where people were just like normal. They didn't have any agenda or didn't have any, you know, uh, socialistic uh, views or wanted to do such and such. But they really, it all mattered about the story, right? It was all about the story. And so you had re these really, really great, um, great characters and you had a real special connection. And, and that's why it still remains such a big deal. And that's why they, they did a remake um, of it. And, uh, and they're even... That series is just amazing, and I just love the whole idea of just people being people, and uh, they're not fake or anything. That the characters are real, you know, really uh, just normal. And even though they have a huge task to do, uh, they have to go on missions and stuff and try to t keep this um, everybody together and have to deal with all the things that are going on and those other ships as well as the big city ship as they escape um, through, you know they have to start up and run again and you know because the Cylons are on the tail again they get somewhere and they, again they're there um they follow them there so yeah and I, that's something that i have to think uh, i think um constantly in my head is like when i'm writing in critical i think about well what is she going through right now as a normal person if she was a human you know the real person even though she's fictional what is it that will that would that she'll be thinking right now she's going through these processes that things that are happening to her uh and and that's what I mean about story and being about normal human beings. And how would you behave if something happened to you? That's how the characters would behave on a normal basis, depending on their stationary in life. Like if they're commander, they have to be, uh, you know, they have to take care of a whole lot of people. If they're, uh, if they're like a soldier, they will just, you know, do they follow orders or they don't? What is What will make them follow orders? What won't make them follow orders? How far will they go with following the orders? Um, and also, I mean, superheroes and comic books, you know, you sort of go, well, what, what, how far will they go? And, um, what is the last bit? What is the one thing that will make them change? And which brings me about talking about superheroes changing from who they are as superheroes and why they would become villains brings me to Injustice, the game, very, very good game that came out. And um, later on, they did a like a, a web-only um, digital comic series. Then they then they get it together and like um, into single uh, single issue floppies, and then they put it into hardcovers and also into trade paperbacks. So they had a four-year run of that, and I really really liked it. I was. I remember the reason I liked it was because way back in 2000, when I moved down to Invercargill to do my studies for the um, in 2003, uh, around about June, I went down a bit uh, six months early to look for work and get settled in. And of course, I did get um, look for work and I found work. Um, and because they had just looked at my CV and said, "Wow, you have a lot of different um, um, jobs that you've done since you were 17." Because that's when I started, actually 16 when I started working. So it's um, because I had left home just before I was turned 17. So you've got all these experiences. You've been a baker. You've been a tile salesman. You've been a tiler. You've, um, you've been a chef. You, um, you've trained to be a chef. You're an artist. You've, you've been a woodworker, you know, and you've done so many different things. And um, so it was easy for me to get a job pretty quickly. I think within a month, I was able to get around to getting a job. Maybe a maybe month and a half, if I remember right. 
so yeah so but then to get myself settled in there there was a comic shop there and um so i basically used to hang out there when i didn't because what are you gonna do for the first six weeks when you have no nothing else to do and you're looking for work and when you don't have you know when you finish going to planning up city how do you hang out with people so i started hanging out at the comic shop that was there it was a really cool shop uh you know and got to meet a lot of people got into uh, tabletop gaming like um i think it was the simpsons as well as like um the risk because i had a great love for risks and i've had a love for risk forever I just haven't had a game for a couple of years now and probably half a decade now having a decent game and so one thing i asked the guy behind the counter at that time i said like i just can't stand bat oh uh, sorry joker i just can't stand joker I, I, you know He's such a horrible, horrible villain. Why don't they get rid of him? You know, why don't they just get rid of this thing? And then, you know, this person that's just such an evil, evil villainous character. And the guy said to me behind the counter, um, you know, he was, I think it was about 10 years ago than me, or maybe five years ago than me. He said, you know, it's because he's such a, such a main character. He's been there from the start and so on. And um, so I remember that. And so when Injustice came out, I didn't really know much about the game as such, um, and but I think it was one of the main my first Xbox games that I might have bought, because I'm, I'm not much of a gamer as such, and I still find it hard because of my wrist being injury, I, I have a problem with um, moving, and some people have it worse than me, of course, but I have a problem with like, you know, being quick on my fingers with, when it comes to the controllers. So when I started reading what the theme of the story was, I was like, and just as gods among us, what, you know, what is the main plot of this? And the main plot is this, of course, if you haven't seen it, uh, please come back in about a couple of minutes. Or if you haven't played the game or even read the comic book. Okay, so, uh, so basically what happens is that Superman, um, Lois Lane is pregnant uh, and she's on a ship. Um, doing a journalism thing, if I remember right, and it's in, oh no, she's on a metropolis, and the ship docks or something, if I remember right, I'm just a bit slightly off my uh, thing there, and she, she passes away because of what Joker does, she blows up metropolis, it like basically sets off a nuke, and Superman loses it, and this is the first time we actually really, really see Superman turn evil, uh, of course, he doesn't turn evil, evil right there, but he basically puts his fist through, um, uh, he finds where, uh, he searches for Joker, he finds where he is, I, th I think he might have used Batman to find him, and he goes there and rips out, He puts, I think he puts his fist through Joker's heart, and I was like, whoa, and I, and I was like, this is just brilliant, it's, you know, it's just talking about, you know, just changing the game, and and it's basically talking about how Superman would behave as a human. Because I've, I haven't liked Superman for decades because of his, his uh, Boy Scout sort of nature where he doesn't, because he's, he's been raised to be a Boy Scout, right? A good boy, uh, you know, uh, raised by elder parents and such and such. And he's always been taught to do right over wrong com completely, even to detriment to other people. So that's why I always say, always thought well why does he let him go why does he just you know send him to jail and whatever and of course he's batman's villain but main villain but he just you know loses it and so then he decides well i've had enough of the of the environment and um you know i've, I've had enough of these villains and so I'm, I'm tired of letting villains run loose putting them in jail and then they just come back out break out and they just come into it carry on with the thing so that is the basis of injustice right so it's, this is just you know so the heroes have failed and so on right so villains take over i mean sorry so superman becomes villainous and batman has to go up against as he is goes up against um superman and superman gets people on his side and batman gets people on his side and it's such an interesting interesting um twist of turns when it comes to the hero genre and especially when it comes to the big two and the whole justice league and this is a really really i mean look at that all right look at that look on the face of um superman 
So he becomes like the world police, all right? He basically becomes a communist dictator. And that's, and that's basically where, you know, uh, Jonathan Hickman's um, um, X-Men's at now. It's like where, where with, um, you know, the Cocoa becomes a, a self-sufficient state where it says we don't want any connection with the world and so on. And we're just going to look after ourselves and close this up and becomes North Korea or communist China. Okay, so that's basically injustice, right? And the game, of course, you know, started with the game and Tom Taylor, the Aussie guy, um, did the, um, the, um, the writing on this. And I think that there were several writers on this. So uh, Mike S. Miller is one of the guys over, um, was a colorist on this. So you can see the amazing work. And, um, and um, yeah, so he's, he's, he's doing his own independent thing right now. And he's been out of the, uh, out of the mainstream for a little while there. Okay. The next, let's talk about some sci-fi again. I will just, superhero, let's move over to sci-fi, then I'll move back over to superhero. And then we'll do some unboxing. I enjoyed unboxing yesterday, it was quite cool. Okay, so the War of the Worlds, the original War of the Worlds. Now, when this came out, right, in um, 1952, they had, um, uh, before the movie came out, they had a radio announcement, and H.G. Wells, uh, um, wrote um, War of the Worlds and you've probably seen um, I actually thought it was Day of the World um, the, when I was thinking about this beforehand I was thinking like the day the Earth still still but that's not it so the War of the Worlds as you know uh, was remade recently uh, probably a decade ago with um, and it didn't do really well uh, with um, Tom Cruise I actually liked it I thought it was okay and uh, excuse me I think I got something in my eye right so War of the Worlds, right? Um, when they did the 1952, um, sorry, I think it might be 1951, um, reading, they did a radio show. They did a uh, adaptation of the book as a radio thing. And everybody thought in America, because it was, in those days, that it'd be live, right? It, and um, they thought it was a news announcement because it starts out being a news announcement, you know? And, um, the, you know, the story. And so... Everybody in America was freaking out, locking the doors, hiding, getting the guns out and all that because they thought they were being invaded by aliens because that's, you know, that's the setting of this. So it was such a huge deal uh, when the radio um, broadcast went out and, and they, you know, like I said, they used to do live. They used to like make all the sounds. They'd have like um, uh, ADR and you have all the sound men sort of side making all the clop, clop, clop sounds of horses and so on and bzz, and all that you know, um, and you have the radio announcer, you have the actors going, oh, it's everything freaking out, it's, there's all these other ships arriving, and there's this, we don't know what they are, and, um, and so, I just realize, if you haven't seen this, you probably already have seen this, but, you know what the ending of this is all about, so I'm not going to go there, right, so let me read, um, read the blurb on this, so this is a 1952 movie, and, um, so H.G. Wells' chilling novel of a Martian invasion of Earth becomes even more frightening in this 1952 film adaptation that's widely regarded as one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time. An Oscar winner for special, a vast special effects, The War of the Worlds delivers eye-popping thrills, laser-hot action, and unrelenting edge-of-your-seat suspense. No one who has seen the movies, um, seen the film's depiction of the swan-shaped uh, Martian machines ticking and hissing menacingly as they cut their path of destruction will ever forget their ominous impact so you know the original war of the worlds like i said had a huge impact on um on on the uh on the I, i'm not sure if it was broadcast across the world on the radio as well but in america especially because this is just six years after world war ii right they just gone through the great Dep depression they had just been, um, you know, a lot of people died. Millions and millions of people died. Uh, families had a lot of loved ones um, and, you know, so on. Great Depression. I think that was after the uh, Wall Street collapse. People had committed suicide and so on. So when this came, you know, when they announced this, 
imagine in the middle, you know, just a couple, not even a decade out from that, a couple years out of that, and you're just freaking out because of what you're hearing. You're thinking it's live. Because, like I said, radio plays were done live. So the adaptation, live. Nobody's saying, hold on, guys. The, what's about to happen is a drama adaptation of this book by H.G. Wells, one of the greatest, greatest uh, sci-fi writers of all time. Right. And uh, of course, you've seen so many of his movies, The Time Machine. And, you know, that's re was recently remake about a decade or so ago, uh, starring an um, Aussie actor. Um, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. And so, yeah, that's War of the Worlds. And it's like I said, if you need anything else to watch right now, get some classics in you. And then once you've read, uh, watch the classics or even read the book, Jump on and do, uh, watch the new one with Tom Cruise in it. Recent one, I should say. Okay. Um, yesterday I mentioned about powers. Um, or was it the day before? I mentioned about powers. And uh, about um, Brian Michael Bendis. Uh, and the most recent one you probably know about is the adaptation of the... Spider-Man to the Multiverse the many spider characters all in this one thing and he's you know he was a creator of miles miller uh miles morales who a lot of people don't like and even people of the ethnicity don't like because it was just a, they believe it's a cheap, cheap ripoff and of course it wasn't a new character as such but it's just an add-on um just taking on the suit and becoming that thing anyway brian michael benders like i said he worked for 20 years in marvel and um, during that time, if I remember right, he worked on a series, uh, on a huge uh, series of um, comics called Powers, which I mentioned the other day was made into a TV series, um, acting the great Shalto Copley, uh, South African actor, African actor Shalto Copley, who was in, um, gosh, I've forgotten, you guys will remember. Anyway, so this is, I picked this up a few years back, about a decade ago, uh, because what I, the reason I picked it up was because he put this book out called Powers, a uh, script book, and it's got illustrations and stuff, and talks about him basically writing, um, you know, it's a script book, basically showing you how um, comics uh, start out, you know, with an idea, and then you get to a script, and how he goes about writing it, and uh, for me, this has been a real treasure because I haven't read much of it because I'm just a guy who, when it comes to things like this, because I've been, I've been to film school. I have, uh, you know, studied film. I have done productions, as you know, and I wrote my own scripts even before I got to film school and all that and all my writing um, for 20 years and such. On. But I bought this, uh, I think at the time it was 20 bucks, brand new on, off Trade Me. And it's, you know, it's like a third of the price, basically, of the US thing. So... You get really cool uh, looks, and I mean, from um, Michael Iommi, Michael Avon Iommi, who did does the artwork for this, and of course it was a black and um, if I remember right, uh, they did a color, um, but they did black and white um, first, of course, before they colored it, and you got really awesome uh, sketches and prelim designs in this book, and so it really um, gave me an idea of. When I was starting to do um, critical, like how is, you know how do they write comic books? I have my own style of writing comic books and the way I set up scripts and stuff. But how do these guys do it? Because everybody's got their own style. I know this. Um, Alan Moore does a lot of detail, but if you look at here, there's hardly any description about um, what's going on, right? He just basically he spec he does a little description. Like he here he goes he goes. Um, Walker opened the has opened the door. Car door. The lights of the cars are now on. Warren holds the gun in his open palms on his lap like a dead baby. So he's basically saying he's cradling it like he's not really paying much attention. That's a really weird one to read, but there it is. So I um, I think that was a really cool thing. You know, it's a really cool book to look at if you're looking at trying to get into writing comics. Uh, but of course, there's a whole lot of um, at some a lot of the trade paperbacks at the back of them or hard covers uh, have um, you know descriptions and um, setups as well. 
about how they write it and stuff. So now let, let you know back to my the hardcover, the definitive hardcover volume one, which you know was is a pretty pretty thick book. It's a lot of pages and it's pretty heavy. And let me just get rid of the cover because I don't like ruining the slip cases on these accidentally. Um, so beautiful uh, ruby. I get red, uh, red, um, uh, shiny, um, can't even remember what it's called now, <laughs> sorry guys, shiny silver red, uh, imagery, um, you know, image, and it's just really, really cool, and, uh, and it's a really good book, and it's another one of my treasures, both of these books are my treasures, so now you have the full color, um, single issues that they used to put out, all collected, I think there's about 12 issues in these, and like at the back of course like i said they sometimes have the script all right for me i think that's a bit, bit of a waste of space having a single page across like that i would have put two pages and then you also see the amazing um amazing artwork and the you know the very cool i mean there's like about a dozen dozen panels on there just of people speaking and there's the thing about this one here there's a lot of amazing dialogue just simple dialogue simple artwork but it's such a good good book i mean you look at this one here right uh i mean the powers book i mean and this is you know all collected here is look at that it's just amazing and he basically does this really awesome uh first scene if i remember right um where this one here like there isn't even a splash page like most comics have a splash page I sometimes do it, sometimes I don't do it, but it just sets the scene. And he talks about how he, um, you know, when he's talking about right at the start here of the page, let's see, let's read it. So he goes, page two, five equal size page long panels. Each panel is the same shot. It's the same uh, crime scene, the same moment as the last panel, but from the top of the, um, top of the stairs of the apartment building, looking down onto the street. So then he just basically goes boom, boom, boom uh, to Michael. And his, this is their own book. This isn't, uh, this was done through icons while he was writing for, um, for, um, you know, coming over to write for um, Marvel Comics. This is way back in 2000 and such. Let me just get the right date of this so that you guys know how old this is. Um, yeah, 2000. So yeah, 20 odd years ago, right? So he wrote, you know they worked on this 20 years ago let me just make sure that the, the script yep so the script book came out in 20, 2001 so this has been reprinted the both of them probably have been reprinted many times uh but the cool thing is like i said it's it just sets you up as to how people you know different writers do different things well one of the cool things um i like um you know i want to mention is these guys came out of um, like especially brian came out of his own or benders it's like everybody calls him he came out of his own independent creator things right he just basically was doing his own things and they saw that he was really good he got some books done through image um and he did his own graphic novel and i think i've got them somewhere if i remember right i've got a couple of those older ones somewhere um and you see you know, in his his own art style is similar to what um, what Ioming does here with this. But Ioming, this is his Ioming's art style, but it sort of crosses over with that. So it's really interesting to watch other people's art styles and to see that sometimes you don't need a certain specific art style to have your book sold or have your have your art um, have your you know if you're doing a superhero thing, you don't have to all have it looking like. Uh, like that right you don't have to have it all looking that detailed you can have it simple and yet effective right you, it's just the way you do it it's just the way you put it out and and of course this is you know various artists do different things different way i you know i do it different ways um seven does it his different way and so on so yeah and that's just that's just like how people learn to to do things and how to learn to simplify and do things quickly all right so let's 
unbox another unbox uh, little clip All right this is the vinyl um, Deadpool and cable and Deadpool set and um, it's got a really really old beautiful little um, this, uh, you know comic book design here with the silver little things around things I haven't opened this so I have no idea what it's like apart from you know seeing it this way here all right uh, vinyl has these little um kind of like funko uh bobblehead type things i don't even know if, oh it is a bobblehead so there's a spring in there i just got it because it was there and i thought it'll be cool to get uh that's it nothing in there apart from this little um, background card right to um to, to two tone diff different colors blue um blue and yellow for a cable and red and black for um of course with deadpool so yeah so that's from the uh, vinyl range and nothing else on here it just tells you that it's cable and deadpool right uh and so they're bobbleheads. I haven't opened these. Oop. Cable popped out. So the little, the the slightly different in that it's rounder compared to the old. Um, where are we? Oop, can't see it. Nope. Can't sneak a peek at um, one of the other Funko ones. But so this, you can see these are different. So like I said, I've been you know I talk every now and then to um, to Rob and on uh, and of course you know the brilliant. Um, Oh, which reminds me, remember, um, as you, if you follow me, you know that uh, on our page that I mentioned Ryan Reynolds being in a show called, um, oh, I never forgot. Zero Man. All right. I've posted about Zero Man that I was watching the anime, uh, anime because I'm trying to keep my, keep myself upbeat. So, and I've been watching a lot of cartoons. I haven't actually watched any TV uh, live action things. And so I've been watching a lot of um, um, mainly funny things like American Dead. Uh, and um, I've just got, um, watched 13 episodes of Zero Man. I think that's all they made. I think it was a can uh, Canadian series. Now, Leslie Nielsen, in case if you don't know who that is, Leslie Nielsen as Zero Man has a voice for that and, and his look on that uh, and designs and everything. He is... he in. In the 80s, excuse me, in the 80s, he was a uh, a very, very big name comedian uh, because he's, he's an older gentleman. And even in, like, he was 60 years old at that time in the 80s. And so he was doing the Naked Gun series, which is a mature, mature, uh, well, not mature, like 13 up sort of funny uh, comedy series like Naked Gun three and a half or two and th one quarter or something like that, and it was a whole a series of them. So if you want something haha to laugh at, yeah, well, that's pretty cool from the eighties. Um, so the Naked Gun series of that. So I was what you know I watched uh, about two three episodes of a while back of the Zero Man series, and so and it and then yesterday I was watching the rest of them because I was like okay let's just take a break from American Dead. And watch um, you know some you know something a bit older something a bit different superhero right so zero man is this geriatric superhero which ha has an alien um, suit which gives him power and he still lives with his grand uh, with his mother at 60 years old and she wants him out of the house all the time and so it's a very funny tongue-in-cheek very hilarious um, um, animated series Kind of a bit more mature, and it's not something you want to, you know, depending on what your kids are into and you know best, that, you know, you can sit around and watch with them. But, yeah, there's a lot of in, inside jokes and such. Uh, but but Ryan Reynolds, Mr. Deadpool himself, plays, um, oh, I can't even remember the name now of the character, but in Zero Man, he plays a, a, a gay uh, assistant to him. So Zero Man... Um, you know, has a gay assistant, and Ryan Reynolds is a gay assistant. So after watching eight episodes of it, I realized that he said said a couple of words. And I'm like, 
hey, that sounds like Ryan Reynolds. Because I didn't look into who it was. All I knew was Leslie Nielsen. Hey, I'm going to watch it. And I knew who that was. But I didn't look at the who the supporting actors or the other characters were played by. So that was pretty cool. So and so I checked out on IMDb, as I said. Uh, and I mentioned the website on Comic Trade that, you know, that I found it really cool seeing him there in 2004 doing a superhero, um, uh, being in a superhero animated series. And then like a decade later, he gets just over a decade later, he gets to become Deadpool. Right. And I thought that is really, really cool. And I, and so, yeah, so let's get, get back to that. So as you can see, you got like the, the gun, it's a basic, it's a, you know, it's a basic design of the, um, of the old, um, um, Funko, as I mentioned, but it's much rounder, and it's if you if you've already been collecting these, already seen them around, then you know what, what they're like. They're not, they've got a specific style, right? So the bodies are, are flatter. Uh, of course, um, you can't just make a similar Funko toy because they have their own set design and intellectual property and registered patents, so you can't go and start making your own versions of that. But you can basically do something different and you can't say well i'm uh, you can't they can't copyright bobbleheads because bobby or patent bobble, bobbleheads because they've been around for whew, decades like way back to 60s and 70s or eight, even 50s maybe depending for these toys so i think 60s was when they uh, 60s 50s when the plastic was a big deal so yeah so cable and i, I like them i think they're all right and they're, they're bubbles um you know the as you can see Cable's a bit more shaky, um, and it's larger. The heads are larger, and Deadpool isn't. But you also here should have a look. They've got the um, katanas, and foot's front, back, normal with the carrying things, backpack type looking things. I don't know. Oh no, that's that's not the back. That's the back carry case for his katanas, the scabbards, and very simple. Um, on the back of cable okay so that's me it for today guys uh hope you've all fine out there and um day seven we got them through it um just got the evening to get through hopefully uh you guys have, are enjoying this let me know if you are and yeah and hey share the video i'm gonna be i'm gonna be um cutting up the clips of this and it'll be on on youtube from time to time once i get it finished i'll be up there uh, we sort of. Um, I'm going to try to keep to the sort of thing. Um, the news. I'll leave it on on, on our on our on our Facebook page um, because some um, at the moment I'm too busy. I don't have time to just grab as much news as possible. But I'll try to keep that up. So yeah. Uh, so there you go. Um, starting off, uh, we mentioned Battlestar Galactica. Then we turned over to Injustice. And the movie and the comic book series. Then we went on to back to sci-fi, and we went to War of the Worlds, and then went back to Powers with a Bendis and his own uh, creator own stuff. And I th later on, when he uh, when he he was uh, I think planning to move over to DC or something. He went over and carried on um, doing more over at um, Image Comics. So he carried on a few more there. I've read all the comics, if I remember right, as much as I think I haven't read the last two years of it, but I've been up to date. And I, I really enjoy that series. I think it's really cool. I actually have the tr first trade paperback as well as the script book and as well as the hardcover. And the first thing was who killed, um, I think the whole, the first series was who killed Retro Girl? So, thanks for joining, guys. Uh, and he was, to be honest, um, so, but he was in, a, I can't remember what year, I think it was 2000 when this came out, like, um, when the Powers came out, he won the best uh, writer of the year for his own work. All right, so, yeah, so, that's Powers. So, if you're just joining, that's Powers. And, yeah, thanks for joining, guys. Uh, appreciate it. And I'd like to, once again, thank everybody who's been sharing this around and um, joining us from all over the world as i said at the start that i've noticed a lot of different names coming on to um, watch 
and uh, who who are new to the page thank you I appreciate it and also for uh, the other groups and facebook groups and comic book groups in new zealand who are actually allowing me to post on their page and the admins are letting you know allowing me to share that we're doing this and um, that i'm doing this and i also coming over to join and also um you know with their group as well as just other pages they've allowed me to just post on there and thank you so much for coming over appreciate it kakite ano keep well keep safe and we're one weekend now it's a habit like i said it takes seven days to create a habit now hopefully we 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 you know we're good and we we can handle this thank you so much and love to your family and be kind to each other and love each other and treat each other well